Okay, so the topic here is about uh, specifically about arthropods rather than um, Cambrian in general. Um, it's sort of a fact of life that all arthropod workers um, like to remind you that um, in terms of, of species diversity, species richness, there's, there's no other animal group that's even remotely comparable to them. Something like 1.2 million living species and of course a myriad fossil species as well. Uh, but it's not just a numbers game, it's also a question of uh, extreme disparity of body plan and disparity uh, of ecology as well. Uh, and when we start to get into um, yeah, functions, things like developing powered flight, uh, evolving use sociality in a number of lineages of arthropods, we start to make a connection uh, with, with, with the nervous system, with sensory biology, so on and so forth. So a lot of aspects about arthropods um, uh, do tap into the evolution of the nervous systems. Now Nick asked a question here at the end. So all this disparity of shape and behavior and, and function and so on, does it correlate with a comparable disparity uh, in, in central nervous system organization? Um, or can we recognize a number of motifs that characterize the major groups of arthropods? Uh, in terms of a timeline for when this stuff happened, I mean, we can literally indirectly use other fossil indications, like when do arthropod trace fossils first appear? And the answer is actually very shortly after the base of the Cambrian. Uh, we've been rather conservative here with this minimum date of 528 million years because these are the oldest well-dated um, Rusophycus traces. But we know that, that arthropod, euarthropod behavior is present in the rock record. Um, you know, I, I would hazard a guess of, say, 540 million years. Um, arthropod brains are beautiful, and arthropod brains have uh, lots of bells and whistles, so to speak. Uh, this is a crayfish brain. Um, it's imaged here using standard techniques of immunohistochemistry. So the red stuff we see in the middle of the brain here um, is the central body, and this has been stained uh, with a reaction, I guess, uh, against anti-serotonin. Uh, uh, the green parts of the brain are different fibers, different neuropil areas. Um, these are stained, I think, against uh, alpha tubulin. And the pink stuff is stained uh, against, uh, actually, I'm not sure what they stained this with. Um, what we see here, anyway, in this brain is lots of complex substructures that we can use for comparative purposes in trying to reconstruct aspects of arthropod evolutionary history, such as, oh, found the pointer, thank you. Um, these uh, antennal uh, glomeruli here, these antennal lobes, and this being a reptant crustacean, we've got different sort of accessory lobes associated with the antennal segment. Anyway, we can do that across the arthropods. There's a great variety of central nervous system characters that people like Nick look at comparatively. So we can look at antennal glomeruli um, in other groups, probably an insect here. Uh, we can look at optic neuropiles. We can look at the arrangement of the axons that are connecting different optic neuropiles. And different groups of arthropods have specialized structures in their brains, such as the noduli here, which immediately I can see this is an insect. Um, Nick's research program largely involves compiling sets of discrete neuroanatomical characters and using these to make inferences about arthropod phylogeny. So he puts together matrices such as the one we see here, which are absences and presences of discrete neuroanatomical characters. He builds trees and he calls this research program uh, neurophylogeny. Um, yeah, for my purpose, I take these nervous system characters and I bung them into my matrices of other anatomical characters and just treat them as a, another class of data. Anyway, um, you take all this nervous system information and we can recognize that the major lineages of arthropods do have a series of conserved characters that Nick would characterize as ground, pa ground patterns or ground plans. They're shared characters that are probably present in the common ancestor of these lineages despite the prolific diversification that's gone on in these major lineages of arthropods. So if we take, say, the brain of an onychophora, and these things are consistently composed of the protocerebrum and deuterocerebrum. It's a two-segmented brain. Uh, we look at the central body of the brain. We can see that it's, it's highly layered in its neuropiles. Um, compare that, say, with the brain of a myriapod, say, Scutigera, the house centipede. Again, there's a layering here uh, of the midline, uh, the central body uh, in the protocerebrum. If you compare that, say, with an arachnid, um, like the scorpion here, we can see there are more discrete and lateralized neuropile areas present in the central part of the brain. And in the largest group uh, of arthropods, pan crustaceans, 
we again see this sort of lateralized and discrete neuropole areas. And these lateralized areas are connected by particularly enlarged axons. So there's all kinds of characters we can use to recognize these major clades of arthropods. Um, a bit of a summary here. Now, those are kinds of characters that you would probably never expect, and you know, realistically, we can't expect to see uh, preserved in fossils. But if we go to kind of gross arrangements of neuroanatomy, you know, how many segments are potentially represented in the pre-stomodial part of the brain? How is the protocerebral part of the brain linked to the visual centers of the brain? How does it relate to the number of eyes, basically the wiring of eyes, the eye stalks, and so on? Um, What's the nerve cord look like? Is it ganglionated? Is it, is it, um, is, are there, is expression of segmentation? Are there peripheral nerves? So on and so forth. These are the kinds of characters that uh, a few of us um, have been wrestling it with um, in, in Cambrian fossils over the last few years. So this is kind of a, a coarser level comparison of some of the major groups of living arthropods and the kinds of characters that unite their nervous systems. Um, I'm not going to dwell too much on the fossils because Shaya has reviewed this stuff at Palace in different years. Um, this is one of the, the, the first fossils about four years ago where we first proposed that some of these structures that are represented either as carbon films or sometimes with secondary layers, a pyrite on top of them, represent remains of the central nervous system. So we're looking at the medial part of the head here. You can see there are symmetrical tracks coming off these structures that in this case are going into the antennae. In other cases, we're seeing symmetrical tracks are going off from the front of this structure, and they're going into the optic lobes. And the interpretation of these things is that these are segmental tracks that are associated with appendicular structures in the head. So we are interpreting these things as degraded remains of the central nervous system. Uh, here's a, another example from the same group. This is a different Fushinuia. This is a different team also working in the early Cambrian in South China. Um, this is work that uh, Kunming has been doing in, in partnership uh, with Nick's group at Cambridge. Um, these structures here interpreted in the back of the head and down into the trunk are interpreted as a segmented ventral nerve cord. So this is a sort of classic rope ladder nerve cord as we see in living arthropods. So it is interpreted as ganglionated and strictly segmental. Uh, a study published in PNAS last year adds a little bit more detail to the same species and is interpreting these tracks that are coming off the lateral part of this putative ventral nerve cord as peripheral nerves. So these are characters that can be used to um, weigh in on where these things might potentially relate to living and other fossil arthropods. Uh, here's another example uh, potential preservation of a ventral nerve cord. I put this one up kind of from a, an imaging angle. Nick's been playing a lot with ultraviolet light, so using UV illumination to try to tease out structures uh, that weren't getting detected by other kinds of lighting. In this particular case, uh, if anyone knows what this animal is, tell us. We've been wrestling with it. It's Arteopoda is the group that includes trilobites and friends. So they are um, arthropods that have a differentiated antenna and then a rather uniform series, or sometimes very uniform series, of biramus head and trunk appendages. Uh, in this particular case, we've got the normal preservation of the gut here. So these GD are the usual segmental gut diverticuli that you get in trilobites and related arthropods. But interior to this structure, again, we see these remains that are uh, um, a, a rope ladder arrangement, uh, uh, connectives and commissures between them. And this looks like, again, preservation of a, a, another nerve cord in a different lineage. Um, here's what we published a bunch of years ago. This is a, a great appendage arthropod. Uh, Alalcomeneus, so related to Leon Coilia that, that Carolyn presented this morning. And the interpretation of these structures here that are preserved with mineralization is that these are traces, degraded traces of the central nervous system preserved in the head region of this arthropod around this gape, which is the es esophageal uh, uh, com uh, opening here, uh, by comparison here to a, a juvenile stage of a horseshoe crab or here to a, a scorpion. And uh, we can see the relationships of the eyes to the anterior part of this. These things have paired eyes. And it appears that uh, if this thing is the nerve cord, it appears that either it's very poorly preserved or it's partly fused up. So there are some characters here that are consistent 
with other anatomical indications that this thing might be related to chelicerates. So that's a hypothesis that was first formulated based on the morphology of the frontal appendages. So some potential other information from the nervous system as well. Uh, here's another kind of one of these uh, great appendage or megachiron arthropods. And uh, one particular specimen I'm going to go at here, this one is preserved in lateral view. Here's the eyes. These things have stocked eyes um, that don't appear to be independently movable. And here we see there's a number of carbon traces, symmetrical carbon traces that are extending out into the optic lobes. So these are in the expected position of optic neuropiles, which are the main concentration of neural tissue in the eye lobes. So in a bunch of these arthropods in these deposits in China and in the Burgess shell material that Javier Ortega Hernandez has been working in, it's often in the optic lobes where we're finding these kinds of traces of structures that we can trace back into medial lobate structures that we're interpreting as parts of the brain. So to summarize this stuff, this is meant to kind of be a mirror image tree to what I showed for the living arthropods before, but don't strictly map this phylogenetically as saying these are the same groups, because in a way, you can take two trees and slide them a little bit. So you can go into grade space. So let me take an example here. There's a paper we did a couple of years ago where we proposed that we could recognize um, some of the neuropile areas and potentially a pair of ganglia here um, associated with the frontal appendages here of a radiodontin um, from Chengzhang. And you know, this is mapping more or less to the kinds of characters that we saw in Onychophora, but this doesn't mean these animals are Onychophorans. If these characters are shared by the common ancestor of Onychophora and Euarthropods, these are potentially symplesiomorphies. These are primitive characters that um, the common ancestor uh, of arthropods shares with each other. OK, this is actually the slide. Um, this is a thing that Nick put together for a review we did in current biology. And I, I, I think there's a lot of potential in this approach. So if you think all this um, neuropaleontology stuff is barking mad, you can wake up now, because we're going to go back to recent arthropods, make some comparisons, and then calibrate them uh, against some potentially safer uh, fossil calibrations. So what these things are, in a way, this action selection center, um, this is the, the, uh, the, the central body of the brain in onychophorans and in arthropods. And you can see, making a fairly quick comparison here, you can see there are a number of close similarities between onychophorans and chelicerates. And again, this doesn't necessarily say that these things are sister groups, but these appear to be shared characters of the common ancestor of onychophorans and arthropods. So what we can do with that, if I, I might just quickly explain the figures here, because they're a little bit stylized. Um, OK, yeah, it won't be long. Um, the central complex of the brain is largely built up of these columnar fibers. The green things here are different neurons, which are crossing between the two sides of the brain. So there's a crossing arrangement here. Um, there's a number of sensory inputs that are shown here as these pink neurons. And these things are arising here um, in, in basically the main processing part of the central body of the brain. Now, this part of the brain is controlling a lot of the choices arthropods make about responses to external stimuli, and particularly the neurons that are associated with appendicular movements are programmed by this part of the brain. So now thinking as paleontologists, this is kind of cool, because if you take this summarized tree and you make a series of ground patterns based on what's shared by the recent groups, you can see that a lot of these characters that are shared, say, by chelicerates uh, and onychophorans, we can resolve down here at the base of their common ancestor. And these characters will be inherited at least up to the branch point between chelicerates and mandibulates. So if we interpolate fossils on the tree in the positions that we place them based on other phenotypic characters, say anomalous caridids, put radiodontins on the tree. Well, most of us say radiodontins branch off here. So they have strictly compound eyes. They have strictly arthropodized appendages. So they've got hardened parts. They've got soft membranous regions in between. They've got condyles. They've got pivot joints. These are shared derived characters with euarthropods. Well, if that is the case, we can make some predictions about what this action center of the brain would have looked like in some of these fossil groups. So if you want to put Kerygmachila or Pamdalurion or some of these other things onto the tree, you know, we're not necessarily, we're not looking at the fossilization of the central body here, but we can make predictions about its morphology based on these ground patterns in living groups. And then we can start to make predictions about um, how these fossils are responding to stimuli. 
and some of the things that are driving our pendicular motions. So I think there's a fair bit of potential in this kind of thinking about how arthropod behavior is driven, what we know about neuroanatomy of living groups, what we know about the time scale. So some of the things I've stuck on this tree is, even if you are not using the fossilization of, the potential fossilization of neuroanatomy, you know, we know that pound group crustaceans, things like E. caris, you know, these fossils are present by the lower part of Cambrian stage three. So by, say, 518 million years ago, we know that split had occurred. So we would predict that some of these more conserved characters, these aspects uh, of the brain, um, had evolved by that time. And now I'm going to get cranky. Oh, sorry, I'm going to get crankier. Okay, or in the case of chelicerates, you know, we know the chelicerate crown group. In my particular case here, um, Wasango caris would be what I would use for that calibration is present at this stage. And we can use the trace fossil record to say minimally uh, when this split occurred. Now this stuff, we're in the realm of molecular dating. There still remains no solid evidence in the trace fossil record or body fossil records for arthropods before the base of the Cambrian. Molecular dates generally cluster around 550, 560 million years for the arthropod on Ecoffrin split, and we could debate that stuff all day. So we, we can use other fossil indications for constraining uh, the time scale. Uh, Nick's conclusions, um, you know, at least some of us would say that neural tissue is preserving in these fossils and it is giving us some insight into some of the coarser characters of the central nervous system of some of the major groups of arthropods. Um, it carries the implication, if this is the case, um, not just the kind of optimization I just did with the central body using fossils, but if this is the case, if some of these gross architectural characters of the brain are actually present in the early Cambrian, then the consequence of that is this stuff um, has been fairly conserved over a quite long time scale. Uh, that's a, it's a review of that point. Um, and I'd refer you to this paper in, in Current Biology a while ago. Nick asked a series of questions about um, how do these conserve motifs? If a lot of this stuff, the basics of central nervous system architecture has been conserved over something like a billion years, how do you relate it to the kinds of diverse ecologies uh, and morphologies that we see in those 1.2 or so million species of arthropods? So um, thanks for letting me be Nick. <laughs>